So every June, I talk about embedded uh, high-performance computing uh, because it's a very much of a Linux-centric Linux -centric business now. Uh, over 90% of the top 500 list is, is a Linux cluster or a constellation. They're, they're all variations of the same thing, but, but everybody's using, and they don't get into specifics about distros. Someone should really look at, at the distro <coughs> distribution on, uh, on the top 500. So lately, we've gotten interested in the green 500, which is a remix of the top 500 list, the top 500 supercomputers on the planet based in on power, or excuse me, on performance alone, divided by the reported power. And it took a couple of years. The Green 500 list has been around for like six years. <coughs> the Top 500 list has been around for decades. Uh, but now the data centers, the, especially the government data centers, have a pretty strong mandate to report true numbers on power and performance because the, there's a presidential directive that they all have to have a PUE of like 1.2 or something by 2015. So power, utiliz power utilization efficiency quotient is basically the, uh, the power into the data center divided by the power that you consider you're getting work from. So that's, so it's, it's servers plus air conditioning divided by servers. And five years ago, a PUE of two was standard for data centers. Lately, Facebook and Google have been given 1.2 for their PUE. Um, so the, the target of uh, something less than 1.1, uh, no one's reached yet. There's, the Department of Energy has a new facility at University of uh, Illinois Urbana-Champaign, the NCSA data center, Blue Waters, that they're hoping to target at like a 1.1 or 1.07 PUE because because they, they uh, have gotten rid of a lot of the electricity, the PDUs, and the APPSs, and they're almost entirely liquid uh, water, you know, uh, uh, non-conductive fluids on the servers and water everywhere else. It's like extremely exotic. They took a tour of the facility, I'm unbelievable. They got one whole building that's about the size of this building, that's the condenser, and you stand in there and the water just rains off the roof. And they, they just made it as big as they could so that they could get as much surface area to the climate of uh, Urbana Champagne, I guess. So, so the Green 500 list comes out on the 29th. Now, they, they had a publication deadline that they've kind of sloughed on. So, so our team that you'll hear from later on tonight has not sent our numbers in yet. We hope to get a uh, performance power efficiency ratio of uh, 0.25. Top of the chart right now is Blue Gene Q at two gigaflops per watt. We're probably going to be at a quarter of a gigaflop. Uh, uh, well, uh, we're going to be at a gigaflop per board, and our boards are going to average four watts, at least for, for the run. We have some, some numbers that, that are more substantially between three watts and five watts. Anyway, I won't belabor you with the details, but you'll get all that later. So, so the green 500 list is becoming as, as important of a list as, as the top 500 list, because now you can't just quote a uh, performance number without saying you know, what it's costing the taxpayer. Um, so I apologize if these slides are kind of slow. I am running on a, a poor EPC here. Um, what else can I tell you about this? So, so my group was very interested in building low power computers and trying to see what kind of, you know, flops we could get out of it, what kind of floating point operations per second. And I partnered with a guy at Sandia Labs who, who liked doing uh, really high-end things and trying to push them down to low-end hardware. So we met in the middle. We built the previous machine for supercomputing in 2002. And this was just a gutted next cube that, you know where that optical drive goes in? It perfectly fit an ATX power supply. And uh, yeah, I was worried about this. So, that was my presentation. All right. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe I'll go through. I'll, I'll just I'll just zoom zoom in on here. So uh, so the previous machine uh, we put three boards in at Supercomputing 2002. That was our first joint project, and then we started demoing these these machines at, at sub subsequent Supercomputing conferences because because uh, that's the that's the big IEEE conference. Uh, 14,000 people last year. I mean, it's bigger than most other IEEE conferences. 
and you get to do either hardware demos, they give you a table for a hardware demo, or you get to do a poster or a paper. So we usually got a, uh, uh, we usually got a table and did a, a presentation. Um, this one here is the, uh, Carnegie Mellon had the Fawn, if you guys remember that, the Fundamental Array of Wimpy Nodes. So we did the Swan, the Super Wimpy Array of Nodes. And you guys may remember this from two uh, hardware hacking festivals uh, where we got these uh, MIPS based, uh, we had OpenWRT on them, but they were, but they, they were big enough, they were a Broadcom reference design, they had just enough RAM and flash on it that we could put Debbie and Lenny on there. So we tried out a bunch of these mesh, remember the 11S lecture, we tried a bunch of, we tried RoofNet and Open Mesh and Batman and all these other routing schemes, just to see if it would work. But more importantly, to see what kind of variation we have in, this, in the power usage. That was two summers ago. I think Bill Bob's dad helped us. Um, what sort of things do you do with your little local supercomputers? So, so like I say, I I I see how how little power we can use. Okay. And the Sandia guy sees how much math we can perform. So he's the performance side. I'm the on the power side. But do you actually do any calculations, or are you just saying well, this, is what, this is the kind of machine we can be, build at, with using this much power? Well, up until quite recently, we were definitely in the joke department. Okay. The, the ARM cores of, of six months ago even, um, well, a year ago, weren't going to give you any, any usable single precision linear algebra. Uh, you'd, you'd get a megaflops out of, uh, uh, out of, out of some of these home-built clusters. Uh, a couple of megaflops. We're, so we're getting gigaflops now. So the gigaflops, you know, the target keeps moving on us, but but our trajectory is better than Moore's law. So we're, so we're going to catch up with the big guys here pretty soon. And and this kind of hobby for a box like this, how much does it cost? Well, so 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 far, what I've, I've shown you is all stuff that was second generation when when we bought it. So uh, like the Broadcom reference boards, those you know you can get. You can get an OpenWRT capable wireless access point now for forty-nine bucks uh, from from OpenMesh. So uh, and that and that'll give you everything you ever wanted in in a wireless uh, server uh, functionality over subnetting. Uh, you know, uh, you probably got uh, you have Captive Portal on there with the OpenMesh boxes. You have got all that stuff built in some some squid functionality, some. Uh, you, know, you can do private IP address space for for one of the two NICs on there. It's uh there's there's not much left that you can't do with one of these open WRT <laughs> box there you know, companies. There's a company around here, Watertown and Aptex, that's, that's built a you know a, um, an ISV and installer business around it. So I, a lot of them are built to just turn on, and then you've got four or five ways to get into it. They auto configure, they go out, they ping, they try to find open SSIDs, that sort of stuff. So you, you can't lock yourself out, and that's that's what the open mesh thing is supposed to be for. I mean, they, they publish publish the root password. They, they're supposed to be open. <laughs> so, um, all right, I'll just show you one more slide because um, so I don't want to get to uh, get to the lectures here. So so we're we've looked at a lot of hardware to see how low power it is and how much. Scientific math they can do, and and we looked at most of these ARM Cortex A9. That's that's the best of the ARM chips right now. But we'll also show you some of these other boxes here today. Anything that's named after an animal is a is a TI product. You can go to Hawkboard and find like an ARM9 coupled with a with a, a DSP, a, a C64 DSP. Sometimes they're on the same SPC, sometimes they're in the same silicon. But, but there's 15 different ways that TI has, has mixed their product line. There are ARM9s, there are ARM Cortex A8s, and right now the top of the shelf is, is the ARM Cortex A9. But there's another generation coming out about six months from now. So, so we'll show you some of these things. I, I really think what the world is going to look like in the future is uh, you're going to be walking around with one of these MK802s in your pocket, and you're going to be staying at the Marriott, the business center at the Marriott is going to have a 50-foot LED screen and all this other cool stuff. And you'll just interact with it, with whatever gestural engineering or whatever, whatever thing they've got that's unique to them. But, but nobody has a laptop or a PC or anything. It'll be like you get on the, you get on the uh, 
the plane with your with your dongle, and that's it. It's got all your credentials on it. It's got your certificates, and uh, and now you're using somebody else's infrastructure for really cool input, like Connects, and really cool output, like like Monsters video screens. I think that's I think that's what's going to happen, because certainly the markets for for even even something like this, you know, I got pants with cargo pockets, and I can probably still get another six months out of this thing, but but you're not seeing laptops like you used to. And you definitely don't see desktop. having this, this whole classes of middleware that the companies that have just migrated over to some other product line have disappeared. All right, guys, so this is Michael Larabelle. For those of you who have been living in a monastery for the last year or so, he runs pharonix.com, gets um, quite a few uh, uh, inside uh, intel from the uh, big, big iron manufacturers and then writes about it, does benchmarking. He also runs openbenchmarking.org, so you guys can run his benchmarks uh, as for a test suite on your own on your own hardware and compare it to his hardware. But he gets the best hardware. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, today I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the arm hardware I brought back with me from Chicago today and then um, about some of the things coming up in the ARM world and in uh, Linux in general in terms of ARM and um, Linux embedded. Uh, first up though, OLPC, this is the OLPC uh, ZO 1.75. Um, I'm not sure if it's released yet. Uh, it was supposed to be released at the end of Q4 2011, but I haven't heard anything about it. Um, inside here, you said? It hasn't. Oh, it hasn't? Okay. Um, well, inside here is a low-powered ARM core, and it is uh, 8 hertz by hertz, I believe. Um, obviously, most people are familiar with OLPC, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, it's running a modified version of Fedora Linux. Uh, it takes a little bit to boot, though, probably a minute and a half. Uh, the screen, um, with the screen included, it's, it's running through about 4 watts. Uh, very simple to use and meant for people in third world countries. While this is booting, uh, one of the best uh, ARM devices that I've found so far has been the Tender 3 platform. The performance is very phenomenal, um, just not for CPU with its quad core plus a fifth companion core, but the graphics performance when using the video binary driver is extremely nice. Um, That's what I did. Thank you. So the Tiger 3 right now, which is the latest generation for NVIDIA's ARM platform, uh, the four cores are clocked at 1.4 gigahertz or 1.5 gigahertz in a single core mode. Plus there's this uh, fifth companion core which operates at just uh, 500 megahertz and it's using a special low power silicon. So basically for um, light tasks or even for some uh, simple audio and video, uh, all four of the quad cores can shut off and it'll just run off this 500 megahertz companion core. Um, as you see, quad core is exposed. Uh, it's booting right now. This is the Kahu tablet, which um, is very open. You can uh, use Ubuntu and uh, basically put Android, Ubuntu, <laughs> Uh, I believe they have a Fedora spin now on here, and yeah, it's totally open, uh, one gigabyte of RAM, uh, dual cameras, very nice screen, um, and then with the dock, with the dock you uh, can attach it to the tablet and you'll get uh, dual USB ports, HDMI output up to 2560 by 1600, and uh, gigabit Ethernet. Um, so yeah, this is basically a wonderful tablet and in terms of performance and just all around use. Uh, one of my favorites, though um, right now the graphics driver is closed source. Though there might be an open source DRM driver coming uh, soon. There's a reverse engineer to run one right now. And uh, NVIDIA's had a customer request to basically provide an open source kernel driver uh, so they can have uh, Wayland support, so you might see that by the end of the year as well. Um, but even with the open source kernel driver, chances are you'll still see the closed source user space for OpenGL and GLES. Um, so that's What's the name of that tablet? Uh, say again? Cardhu? Uh, C-A-R-D-H-U? C-A-R-D-H-U? Yeah. Um, it's basically their reference uh, developer tablet. How yeah. much? Uh, good question. It's hard to find right now. Um, Thomas, do you have any idea? Um, basing it on last year's information, uh, it's about, uh, they had it 700 in the building. Oh, wow, okay. Um, yeah, so basically I got this for free from the video, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I don't know, but then, um, I'm basing off last year and based on, um, because I'm part of the video developer, 
um, group, and they haven't even given me one, uh, even access to buy it. So okay. Um, uh, well, so if you can find one, it's a great tablet um, for <laughs> development. <laughs> Um, aside from that, uh, I totally recommend the Panda Board ES or the normal Panda Board. Uh, Texas Instruments is pretty great. Um, what they're doing right now with the open source graphics driver is good. All around, it's a pretty open source um, drivers. Uh, Ubuntu is producing the daily images of the OMAP4. So basically, you can be using the latest um, Ubuntu 12.10 or 12.04, great performance. Uh, Fedora 17 ARM G8, which was released yesterday, that also supports the uh, Panda Boards. Yes. So basically, um, really great all-around support for the Panda boards. Uh, good performance, as you'll see, and interesting possibilities with the Panda board clusters that MIT is doing. Um, with the next generation OMAP, you'll see the Cortex A15, which will be beautiful. Uh, really great performance. Uh, likewise, for the next generation Tegra, that will be Cortex A15 as well. Um, right now, the Linux support for that is still coming about, but. By the time the first hardware ships, by the end of the year, it should be in pretty good shape in terms of upstream support things to Linaro and other involved projects. Um, aside from NVIDIA and Texas Instruments, uh, Qualcomm's been doing some pretty interesting things lately with uh, the Snapdragon. This is one of their mobile development platforms. Um, their support's pretty good. They don't have as friendly open source support as uh, Texas Instruments or Samsung with their Exynos. But overall, it's still pretty good. And then, uh, if you haven't heard, uh, Rob Clark, the uh, OMAP uh, driver developer for uh, Texas, Texas Instruments, reverse engineered and began writing uh, open source driver for um, Qualcomm Snapdragon Adreno because he couldn't do anything for Texas Instruments due to NDAs and such. So there's an open source driver coming through that way via Texas Instruments. Um, <laughs> Do you have a good idea of, of how the, those projects compare? Like, is Lima much more mature than Freeduino or? Uh, Lima right now is much further along. Uh, Luke's been working on that as well as other people at CodeThink. Um, it can render basic triangles via the Android app. Um, Lima's not attempting to write a kernel driver. They're just trying to replace the closed source user space of um, ARM's uh, Bali. Mm -hmm. So um, they're a bit constrained there because they're not going to try to break any interfaces with the kernel. But um, yeah, they're basically just uh, reverse engineering the user space. Um, but because they've been working on that for several months longer than um, Rob Clark has, it's a lot much further. Um, in terms of Free Drano, last I talked to Rob, he hopes to have more progress in the next few weeks, except, um, yeah, he's a bit tight because he can only do it as a hobby. And obviously, Texas Instruments isn't going to let him work, use any of his business time or anything else to work on that. And um, he's the only one working on that as well right now. He doesn't have any other developers. Um, so overall, Lima's going along pretty well. Uh, with the Nuovo driver for the NVIDIA, they do have a model working for the Tegra 2, except that it hasn't been talked about in large scale yet. I think it's still in a Git tree that's not um, exposed to the public. I had a friend who tried building it. Um, I couldn't get it working on Zoom, and I still have that. Uh, using the mainline, or did you know about the? I'm not sure. OK, because like, yeah, as far as I know, the mainline for um, Nuovo won't support Tegra yet, but there's this hidden branch. Um, so overall, um, there's still a few issues, in, mainly in terms of graphic drivers for ARM, but overall, um, the situation is improving a lot. Uh, with the A15 and other next generation hardware, the performance should be extremely compelling. Uh, right now, even like the Panda board is uh, pretty well for um, current generation tasks and just using your web browser or um, basic audio and video, office applications, etc. Uh, with the A15 as well, uh, virtualization should be becoming more compelling as well as ARM in the server space. Uh, Kalsey uh, published benchmarks earlier this week claiming uh, 15x uh, performance per wide advantage over um, the Intel Xeon E3. And so that's a very, very exciting space, especially with their 192 core server that they have uh, coming out using MPI with their 5 watt server boards. Uh, yes, and HP announced that Moonshot, their project to have to do ARM servers, is basically not going to come about. Instead, they're going over to Intel Atom now for x86 servers. So HP's already abandoning the ARM server space. That's that's just absolutely unconscious. Right, it is. That's a fun site. It's a very strong hard. Right, and then yeah, even as recent as last month, they were promoting it at UBS and all that. Plus the fact that they're just going to a worse system. <laughs> the, I mean, they're using the um, Medfield 
into a lot of them. So oh, they are using my pillow. Okay, that's nasty. Yeah, they're just more. Um, I really, everything they've done with ARM has been a failure. They right. They the touchpad when they bought Palm. Yeah. So they're probably just got cold feet and they're just stupid for not going deeper. Well, deep. so the good news is Hewlett Packard can be bankrupt in a year anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, Yay. Yeah, so they can eat hubris for a little while. It's, it, it's un unbelievable. How can you screw that up? Uh, they bought a company for $2 billion and then dropped all of their products and fired everybody um, a year later. So uh, they're pretty good. They have good business practices. Well, and the tablet only got interesting when web OS was, was open sourced, right? It yeah. hasn't been open sourced yet. Oh, it hasn't? Well, it, got, it got interested because of me. So. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> um, yeah, and in terms of uh, like ARM platforms that I've been exposed to, uh, software platforms, um, aside from Android, obviously, uh, Bluetooth coming along pretty nicely, as mentioned, with uh, the Panda board. But aside from that, um, for the Freescale IMX 5 series, uh, Ubuntu does provide official images as well as the daily development images for the current release plus one, so for 12.10, they already have daily IMX 5, OMAP 3, and OMAP 4. Um, okay, well, well, since you brought that up, yeah. like, yeah. guys like Steve and me are having problems with, with things like the Afika and Max that can't. can't Request pass Maverick or Natty or something like that. There's a whole bunch of devices out there that will not get, let you progress to the next Ubuntu. Well, in terms of so, like where, where are you getting held up? Well, so so they won't even give you an image. Yeah, an ECU you have to you have to download their image and do a DD. Well, can we, can we try using the Ubuntu provided image or? Uh, they they don't support it. You, you do an app get upgrade and it savages your your. Right. The one that the latest images built and you require support for some, I don't know if it's Thumb or some other like instruction uh, extensions that the older processors don't have. Or, or some, some class of ARM devices. Okay, so are there some IMXs that, because this might be a Thumb 2 issue is what you're saying. I, I, I don't know if it's exactly Thumb or some, it's something like that. Okay. There's, there's some subset of instructions that uh, uh, Ubuntu images use that a lot of uh, ARM processors don't support. All right. So the Cortex series will support, but the latest ones, I should say, but the, some of the older ones don't have support for that uh, subset of instructions. Okay. And so that when 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 you try to run that on a processor that doesn't support, it fails at that point. Gotcha. So maybe we should look at a different distro just to see if that will take them on a distro. Yeah, um, well, so aside from um, Ubuntu, uh, the Arc Linux support for the different ARM platforms has come along pretty nicely. Okay. Um, like the Tender 2 trim slice, that works fine there. Um, I think they also support the Freescale. Okay. But yeah, the Arc, the Arc Linux ARM community is quite vibrant. Okay. Um, and then you have Fedora is expanding pretty well. They support with the yesterday 17 release, the Versatile Express trim slice, uh, not the Tegra 3 though. Panda boards, Beagle board XM, uh, and a few other really obscure development boards from the different ARM vendors. Um, so those are basically the software platforms that I definitely recommend that I found good experience with and work pretty well on our classic documentation on wikis and just all around. <coughs> and that's all hard work, all the ones you just mentioned? Um, I uh, I think Fedora 17, they still produce um, non hard flow images along with hard flow. Um, but yeah, you just give the option. Uh, with the Tegra 3 right now, or even the Tegra 2 from NVIDIA's images, uh, they have hard flow drivers that are currently in beta, yeah, but the root file system is still um, not hard flow. Huh. Except, um, so they just did the ARM uh, Linux for Tegra release 15. Yep. Uh, with the 16 release, they'll rebase all their packages from 11.04 to 1204. And at that time, they'll also switch over to hard flow. Okay. So it'll get a lot better there. So the Tegra 3 performance will be much more amazing in the couple, next couple of months. Hmm. Um, what else is there? Um, yeah, the X server is not working on here right now, so I can't show anything on this aside from a terminal without a keyboard. <laughs> um, I think that would be about it then. What kind of hardware, uh, excuse me, what kind yeah. of hard drive is in, is in the old PC and, and the card? Is it, is it SSD? Or? Um, within uh, the card this is actually a 32 gigabyte SDHC. Huh. Uh, there is also, I think, uh, 16 gigabytes of onboard storage, which right now is for Android. Yeah. Because uh, I 
they're basically a lot of the loaders who uh, move from either the uh, SD card or the internal hard drive. Yeah. Unless they dropped it, it was 32 gigs last year. Uh, oh, it was, so there might be 32 still on, don't know since I never use it, because our, actually let me look at the message. Yeah. So you can boot from an onboard image, you don't need the SD card. R right, yeah, because it was totally open. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is 32 gigs. Um, and then within here is, for this oil PC, uh, 8 gigabytes of storage. Any other very rugged thing. Um, so yeah, that's pretty nice as it finally ships, if it does, ever. I think they're going to just um, stick to the XO3. You're um, right, uh, the tablet version, or? Yeah, it's just tablet. Right, right, right yeah. It's, uh, but that, when they, they officially unveiled it at CES, right. and it has the same processors in that, so I think they're just skipping that all. Yeah, probably. That was more popular. So that's another company that tried every processor in the book. They started out with Geos. Right, and then they moved over to Vaya and then over to ARM. Yeah. But hopefully they'll be content with ARM. <laughs> or next, maybe until Adam. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah put a fan in it. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Uh, not directly related to ARM, but um, what do you think of the graphics of the Power VR uh, Adreno and Nvidia's offerings? Um, in terms of performance, uh, driver openness, or what perspective? Well, we already know what Linus thinks of uh, Nvidia, so. <laughs> oh, well, right, right, yes. Uh, Nvidia does not like, <laughs> or uh, Linus does not like Nvidia. Um, Adreno, their proprietary driver from what I've dealt with is okay. Uh, even for just a simple mode setting driver or 2D acceleration, they don't have anything mainline in the kernel. Uh, at least with Texas Instruments OMAP, they now have the DRM driver that does provide um, simple open source support that's mainline along with the DRM and the mainline kernel as of 3.1, and that's been improving since. Uh, in terms of overall open source quality from an ARM product that's officially supported by the company, uh, what I'd most, rec most recommend right now is the uh, Samsung Exynos. Um, those developers are very active. Uh, they now have 2D support, um, along with some other like obscure features, I believe, for wireless displays, um, and some other things going into Linux 3.5 and Linux 3.6 uh, for improving the performance, cleaning up the code base, and just continuous improvements rather than just dumping the code and leaving it. Uh, Texas Instruments, they've been doing some fine things, but yeah, it's basically rock back there, whereas uh, Samsung has several developers devoted to their efforts. So if I had to recommend one piece. One arm vendor solely on their openness towards graphics. I'd recommend Samsung. Cool. Is the Nuvo driver for Samsung? Or is that for uh, Samsung? No, that, that's for the Nvidia Tegras. Oh, it's for or Tegra. the unofficial one, and then the Mango Line one is just for the GeForce and Quadros okay. on X86. Samsung uses Mali? Is that their. Uh, for the 3D core, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it was quite handy. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Well, what uh, Samsung drivers do you use for the processor on Cotton Candy? Is that on map or? No, it's Samsung. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Those, uh, All right, well, in the absence of Federico, maybe Brian's ready to make the great product announcement. We can show things. Is that uh, web accessible? Yeah. And if anyone know. wants to check out uh, the Tiger 3 or the Oil PC, I'll have them over here. So I guess we're going to talk about some things that Kurt and Amir and Kurt, you'll have to, in to introduce the core team. I get in on the pictures at the tail end of it. So um, that, that's always a fun thing to do. But uh, they've worked on some really cool stuff, getting this. Essentially, it's a supercomputer, multi-processor, lots of panda boards all wired together and through uh, just the standard Ubuntu distribution and software that uh, Amir and his, his uh, colleagues have worked on previously over a course of, what, three to six months? It sounds like is what you guys have been working on this for. Uh, put together a system that is really, really very cool. And so, the the uh, is, I got myself an old system up there that's sort of in the process of installing a version of Mint, which is sort of an alternative to Ubuntu. But the nice thing about phones these days is you can sort of, you know, when, you, when your computer's not working, you get most of the stuff on the phone anyway. So, so the question really is, what's a supercomputer? You know, and and uh, what is a supercomputer today is really very different, I think, than what a supercomputer was ten years ago or fifteen years ago. Or, and so there was an IEEE article, don't know if it was the same one that Kurt was referring to, that uh, was published in October 2009. They talked about essentially energy efficient supercomputing technology. And so 
in, in the good old days, and uh, you know, I think some of us enjoyed the good old days and have lived through them. So back in the day of Cray Computer and stuff like that, it, you know, people were really uh, custom developing hardware. Maybe even some people here worked on custom hardware that was geared towards supercomputing. And of course, eventually came along commodity processors that made the desktops, you know, whether you use a Mac or a PC or some other flavor. Uh, they essentially are commodity processors, whether it was from National Semiconductor in the early days, or Motorola, or, you know, most recently uh, Intel, and, or ARM. I mean, there's this kind of onslaught of ARM devices from all sorts of different places. You see it in the XO, you see it in these little devices, you see it from Texas Instruments, and uh, you, you, you know, people talk about sort of the fracturing of the market with, with Android, right? Different versions of Android and stuff like that. I, I mean, what is ARM? In, you know, depending upon which vendor, whether it's Samsung or TI or whomever it is, uh, ARM to, to each of those different vendors means different things. Different instruction set, as we can see here, Ubuntu. It's available for, you know, Freescales, or, or maybe it isn't available for Freescales. It's available for Samsung's ARM, or maybe it isn't available for Samsung's ARM. So, um, you know, I'm certainly enthusiastic about the forthcoming Medfield from, from Intel. It, you know, eventually it's going to ship, it's out in phones. And, and certainly Intel has in the past week, in fact, this guy Bell uh, has been, you know, kind of really pushing back on why does the x86 instruction set really need to be less power efficient than ARM? So certainly ARM has had the uh, stronger position of uh, we're much more power efficient, you can get it in phones, you can get it in, you know, printers, you can get it in all those different devices. So therefore it must be more power efficient. Be very interesting to see what happens when Medfield comes along. Much lower, I mean is it three, four, five, six watts? I don't know, but it's not much more. And uh, it's just gonna run these distributions straight out of the box. At least it should, in theory, right? So what does that certainly should make life easier and more interesting for uh, for lots of developers and, 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 uh, and users. So, I hadn't heard about the HP bailing on ARM, but I suspect there's something to that other than, you know, Intel just paying them gobs of money and giving them gobs of free uh, server boards to, to go to town with. So, what we're going to show here is we're going to show this really cool device that Kurt put together. We'll start with a little video, which is Kurt, uh, well, first we'll show a two minute video of just sort of uh, Kurt putting this thing together out in the field across the way, and then Kurt and Michael talking about the details and how they put it together. But if you have questions about, you know, how much it costs and where can you get your own, then, then uh, those are the guys to direct the questions to. The question came up earlier about, so what do you do with this stuff, right? And a great question. The, the uh, theme behind the IEEE article uh, three years ago is essentially weather forecasting. Weather forecasting is important. We all, particularly in this, you know, this time of back-to-back record-setting 100-degree days, um, it, it's pretty important, but it's a huge computational challenge to, to figure out, well, what is the weather going to do? Another one is, and not to name names, but, uh, you know, if you're doing simulations of, like, bomb blasts or, uh, you know, impact on heads and helmets, and whether it's in sports, football, or, you know, the military, or what happens when your kid goes down on their motorcycle, it's good that they've been able to run simulations with crash test dummies digitally rather than with real people. Um, Article in the Wall Street Journal today at, at Duke University. I don't know if anybody saw it. Anybody see it? The, uh, the, you know, right now we've got megapixel cameras. Well, they've come up, they've devised a custom made gigapixel camera. So it's not going to be long before they're talking about several years before essentially commercialization. Uh, you know, they get a few hurdles to cross, like I don't know if it takes 18 seconds or 18 minutes to image a frame. But, <laughs> you know, so there are a few. But when you image the frame and then you've got uh, a gigapixel image is the kind of thing you stand here on the bridge and take a picture over towards you know the Prudential and you can kind of see what people are doing in the third floor of it, the It does yeah. normal exposure time but it takes forever to pull all 70 images from the 70 micro cameras. Right. So if you can imagine the benefit of doing something like that with Kurt's uh, supercomputer in a box. Well that, that's kind of like that, that guy who came up with the uh, that that you don't have to focus it camera, whatever micro, that was. Micro, micro. Yeah, yeah, because because there they had a whole wall of when when, when his thesis started. <laughs> yeah, he had a whole wall of ca cameras, and now he's got capital uh, from venture venture capital, and now it's like a cigarette tree box or something like that. 
Yeah, yeah. So this, I mean, it's all it's great in the sense that it's it's miniaturization in the finest. It's uh, reduction in power. Kurt talked about that. You know what what companies like Google and Facebook and Apple is. You know they're all doing this stuff to because because uh, energy is really a, a, a key constraint in their business. Um, and there's another uh, sort of the, the gist of this this article. What it basically says is that it took us a long time. You know, coming from Cray to where we are today, to realize that you don't need dedicated, unique. Uh, custom developed hardware. It's just it's it's commodity standard uh, processors, which we you know if you count how many processors are in this room or in people's pockets or in their backpacks, there are gazillions of them today, right? So what we'll start with is a very short video. Uh, we'll we're going to kind of fix this up a little bit to make it more interesting over time, but we'll show you what Kurt has accomplished with and and this does actually work. I I. Uh, I love these announcements that are, you know, just purely vaporware, where people come up with, the, you know, the cold fusion types of stuff that, that you know, and it just really doesn't work, right? Uh, but this stuff actually amazingly does work. And okay, so here's the. We'll just show you a quick. This is a short video, and uh, there's actually no sound in it, so don't worry too much about that. You got any Jason girls? Just my daughter. Keep your eyes off. It's kind of like the technological film on speed dating. So it's how quickly can you get a supercomputer assembled in <laughs> outdoors. <laughs> nice. So that was about three quarters of the at 148 watts. Yep. Yeah, we get to 200 watts pretty quick. That's the network connections, right, Kurt, for the different boards. So the boards are all interconnected. Yeah. Is that Ambrose's solar, uh, it's a battery? Which yeah, they, 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 because it's fire engine red, they call it the solar pop, popcorn card. Popcorn? Yeah, you know the you know the vendors that have the popcorn carts. This is the great reveal. Mm -hmm. Those trash containers. So that is a uh, <laughs> that is a plaza trash container that modeled after the uh, uh, big belly. Very nice. Yeah, so so that, and, and you I keep the movie they use it. Yeah, and, it. and you keep the doors open yeah, for cooling. Um, so we haven't decided yet. The the pandas ship with nothing on. We might put a heat sink. Um, I don't think we've had any heat related failures yet. We've had every other kind of related failure. Uh, but I don't know. Um, we those, just need to stop them from relating to each other. Those flaps are very tempting to put, you know, as those damp put dampers on them or something. So, whoa. Uh, Is there th This garbage can full of pandas gets you. How many MIPS uh, flops? All right, so Amir and I are still working on it. We have we have a, an ugly curve with this particular switch. You get you you get a, a double precision gigaflop per pan board. Um, when you stick it into Ethernet and you put a second one in, you, it goes sublinear. But you finally get out of it around panda board 30 or whatever. So we're going to get. Uh, an average of a gigaflop per board when we when we finish our runs. Our problem is we've been having having spots of nodes drop off during the run, and it's one of these things that it's it's an all or nothing. And how many nodes? Uh, forty eight. Forty eight good ones. So you're so you're looking at forty eight gigaflops. Yeah. In a, in a field deployable garbage can. Yeah. Yeah. And like I say, we haven't figured out what the application is yet. Um, but we, we have to do the benchmark anyhow, so we're doing that for it. Um, OMAP 4 has neon on it, so we can get better single precision numbers. We can get a lot better single precision numbers. Um, but, that, but that's not, um, but, but that's not uh, the benchmark group won't accept that. That's not double precision. So, Kurt, if you had paid for the parts to put this together, how much would it have cost? Well, certainly, even with the, the discount that Michael and I got, um, you're paying no less than 150 per board, and that's if you, you find them, you know, through eBay and stuff. So, um, five, five grand worth of worth hardware. Right. So, so pretty much under 10 grand. So, to get equivalent performance 
of a, you know, of this 10 years ago, what would it have cost? Well, well, we're competing against 10 years ago, and coincidentally, we kind of are, because the paper we had to write to, to compare apples to apples had to reference a core two duo cluster. And the only cluster we could find in the history of the top 500 was 2008, and it was a core two duo cluster. So we, we looked very, very favorable of them, certainly on, on performance per watt, and then, you know, because of the five-year time difference, we look okay on performance, too. Uh, we wouldn't today. I mean, you, you trot out a cluster now, and uh, you know the, the target. It's a moving target. If you do an Intel cluster or x86 or x86-64 cluster now, you're probably not paying what you were a year ago. You're probably paying two thirds what you were paying a year ago for at least equal performance and probably better performance. A year, not 18 months, because this open compute initiative has really changed the. Uh, the, the fundamental, the price dynamics of putting together a data center. So now we'll, do, we'll show a video as Federico kind of is able to have some, some time just to put things together uh, of Kirk and Michael sort of really walking through the components of this thing. The other thing not to lose, so basically what you just saw that quick video clip was it literally, it was outdoors, it didn't take long for Kirk to, you know, sort of relocate it and assemble it, plug it in and power it and it was powered off of a 12 volt battery of some sort. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't plugged into house kind of. Uh, that panel How many sort watts of, did you get off of the, the solar array? Right, so the panel, under, you know, it understates what you really need. You really need, you know, something that's equal. If you had something, if you had four of those, you literally could leave it outdoors, you know, 24 hours a day, 12 months a year, and the thing would be self-sustaining. Yeah. Cl close to that, so, right? So we're going through a battery anyhow, just in case a cloud goes by. So so we, we did cheat. We charged the battery up. We got it's a it's a 400 watt inverter on there. We've got a 200 watt load, and with peaks at 250 and 260. Oh, you're showing. And we got a car battery that probably gives us 20 kilowatt hours. So so we could we could do a an outdoor thing and burn it all day long and, and not not drive the battery down. But yeah, that was. And how much does that solar array cost? Um. So the, the the battery combination, the battery inverter combination, was cheap. Um, do you remember what that Xantrex uh, 400W was? 70 yeah. watts. Yeah. yeah so. And then and the solar panel, at least until until the, uh, the U.S. government instituted 48% tariffs on PV, was, was cheap, too. That was about Federica. three bucks a you watt. Some lights and it was about a 100 watt panel, so, so 300 bucks. Let me just throw in the lights. And another 150 it's, bucks. It's, it's, what was the inverter used for? Um, we, we haven't quite figured out how to go completely DC yet. Our, okay. our USB hubs are five volt. Our panda boards are five volt. But uh, <coughs> but the only DC powered switch we could find was 12 volt. So we're going to have to get into some exotic piece of maximum PowerPoint tracking stuff that we haven't invested. Yet. Okay, right, right. Yeah. So, so that's a micro sign inverter on the back of the panel. Uh, yes. Go to, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So we so we just did AC. That's, so this is the uh, okay. so this is the cluster we're currently working on. It's a it's a dense, high performance uh, embedded cluster built out of uh, Ooh, Texas of lights. panda boards. Panda boards have the TI four. Cool, okay. They don't go out the four. Our model, the, um, the early panda boards had the 44, 30 OMAP on them. Uh, each of the nodes runs at one gigahertz has two cores uh, and a gig of RAM. And we're running right now, we're running uh, a benchmark, a scientific benchmark, just to see what kind of performance we can get. Later on, we have a couple of applications we're going to investigate to see if we can get some usable uh, science out of this. We're going to look at a molecular dynamics program and uh, some protein folding uh, applications and see how well those run on the ARM architecture. The ARM architecture is, is substantially different than the like, conventional architectures, the x86, substantially, which is substantially what we use in scientific uh, But we're, we built this cluster for a proof of concept experiment to determine uh, a couple of things, both on what kind of high performance we can get out of it, and uh, more particularly, what kind of low power usage we can get out of it. And we'll compare both of those numbers. We'd like to get we'd like to get some reasonable performance out of it relative to uh, the x86 multi uh, similar model of x86. And we'd like to certainly meter and, uh, and document that we can repeat the low power experiments.
But we, that's what the seniority guard came One or two of the power it. aspects we're looking into uh, concern being able to have fine grain control over the power usage of each individual pan and board. Uh, one thing you can do with, with the new software we're using is turn off uh, individual cores when you're not using them. Uh, alternately, you, you're allowed to uh, change the speeds of, of individual cores. You can change them independently. The lowest speed we can run on our panda boards is 300 megahertz. There's two other levels that we can run at and then, and then full out at one gigahertz. So we're going to do some experiments by, by evaluating uh, what kind of performance we can get done at the lowest speed and the top speed and find out if that uh, power level is worth the trade-off. Um, we're also going to check and see whether or not turning nodes on and off in some capacity, either going into suspend RAM, which is suspend, or, or, or writing the state to the, to the disk, which is hibernate, and then coming out of hibernate and recovering the state from where we were. We're going to experiment with those to see if, if they're worth the trade-off in time against power. We know that you'll use less power in suspend and hibernate. We just don't know if it'll be worth the time. It may be, may be worth the time and power just to turn nodes on and off if boot times are, are low enough that, that they make sense to do it that way. The proof of concept demonstration to show what our low power usage is will be, uh, we're going to take this outside and hook it up to solar panels to demonstrate that, that you can run this uh, in a fairly low power, low energy environment. And, and we're doing that mostly to demonstrate that uh, you can run it off of solar panels in the middle of a, a field not connected to any power. That will be our, our proof of how low power it is. Each panda board we have consumes uh, somewhere between three and six watts, closer to the six watts when we're full out at, at one gigahertz running 100% of our, of our math benchmark. And uh, that appears to scale linearly. We're, we're finding that we're, we're able to scale up. Right now, uh, I have my watts up meter. We're at 190 watts for the 48 panda boards plus the seven USB hubs and the, tw and the 48 port switch. Um, actually, no, we've taken the switch out of the equation. The, uh, that's just for 48 panda boards. So, you know, 200 watts divided by 50, we're, we're tracking at about four watts right now. And that's with some percentage of them at 100% utilization, but most of them uh, at, uh, at, at closer to maybe 10% utilization. Um, one thing we'll be testing with the, uh, with the watts up meter, with the power meter, is to see how much power we use when all 48 of them are at 1 gigahertz at 100% CPU utilization for two cores. And then like I say, we'll test out some of the other uh, options, turning off cores, throttling down the cores we aren't using, and we'll experiment with turning nodes on and off and see whether or not 100% utilization of 50% of the nodes is better than 50% utilization of 100% of the nodes. I think this would be a good, good test to, to find out. And a 48 node cluster is a good, a good place to, to do tests like that. We are going to be testing this uh, for, for two purposes. We want to document and uh, see if we can repeat the tests for the power management. And that's primarily for a poster that we're submitting to the IEEE cluster conference. This year it's in, it's in Beijing in September, and we're right on top of the deadline. So we're documenting that, and we're preparing that material for the paper. The other reason, the other test we're doing this weekend, and what we'll do the solar power standalone test for, is to document that, uh, that we can do a green 500 run, which is the, uh, it's a very specific benchmark under very specific conditions. Uh, it's the high performance and impact benchmark and uh, we have to target it at uh, uh, double precision uh, math. We've, we've got a couple of algorithms that we'll test that out and make sure that we're compliant. And the one thing that we're doing differently, our special sauce this year is running it off the solar panels. So we'll document the process and the procedures, and then we'll also capture the fact that we're running it off of uh, our own generated power. Right now we're tracking individual performance uh, in per board at around one gigawatt double precision. Um, we're looking to scale that up slightly super linearly, so, so more than 48 gigaflops for 48 nodes, and slightly 
less than 200 watts <laughs> for the 48 node. So, so that's going to be about 0.25 gigawatts per watt. And, uh, and that's, that's, a good, that's a good ratio, that's a good green number. Uh, we hope to be able to document that this scales linearly or superlinearly in larger clusters as well. So one reason we put this together this way, we've overlapped panda boards because we wanted to try to make this as dense as possible as part of our proof of concept demonstration. Uh, one thing you can do with panda boards that you don't have the luxury of doing with some other uh, single board computers is overlapping them and, and putting them in real tight, tightly constrained environments because your, your, your air cooling and your air conditioning uh, requirements are much lower with the panda board. We don't have any blowers or fans on this right now. If we closed it up and made it even denser, we'd want to put some fan or some uh, blower system on it. But it's certainly a lot less. We don't need air conditioning. We, we would need, at most, fans. And uh, we're going to experiment with that, too. So this, this lends itself to a very dense cluster arrangement that you could stick under your desk or in a closet at work. And, and with only using a 200 watts, you could run it off the house current. So one of our big research paths is investigating bringing some of the data that, that people, the data and applications that people have now franchised out off-site because of the power usage and the uh, and scalability issues. Bringing that back in to, to your own data center or possibly into your office because of now, you, now you've got a, a certain level of performance for a, for a very reasonable power budget. So this could, could actually bring some of the applications that people have, have migrated up to cloud uh, servers, they, they can now bring back down to, to their own office. And we think there there's probably an opportunity here for, for what they call a missing level to bring some of these applications into the office and have have, a, have the kind of control you have over a, over a, a supercomputer or a cluster that, that's right on your premises. So as far as explaining, this is a very low power cluster of 48 panda boards that consume less than 200 watts of power while being very high density. This is actually a trash can that was modified with a um, server um, switch and all everything else. Uh, very easy to build, but it's also fairly cost effective with a single panda board. There's 48 of these in here retailing for less than $200 and presumably in the coming months. The price will drop lower as there's new ARM models that are being introduced, etc. Um, and then actually setting up the software side of this is very easy as well. Um, all of these nodes are running with default for LPS, which of course is a very popular Linux distribution. And from there, we're using a pretty much stock package set of the Linux 3.2 kernel, the MPI, MPI libraries as found in the Ubuntu 4, and all the other software packages. So it was very easy to install Ubuntu, install a package in the that will cross all 24 nodes, and from there you're going in a matter of a few hours. Um, and that's yeah, very wonderful. Um, so with the Panda board, you have basically 10100 Ethernet, uh, dual USB 2.0 ports, uh, HDMI, so you, you can drive up to HD displays on here. Uh, the graphics are backed by PowerVR. Uh, they're kind of the driver works out well. Um, audio and 5 volts. As Kurt was explaining, these boards consume between 3 and 6 watts depending upon the load factor. Um, with the Panda board ES, which is the 1.2 gigahertz variant, I'm seeing roughly the same power consumption as well. Um, besides Ubuntu, uh, Fedora has been enabling Linux support as well for ARM, uh, Arc Linux, Gen2, and all the other Linux distributions as well involve some concerted effort towards ARM. Considering the growing market, just not in uh, mobile devices, but going into servers, especially with next year's um, ARM server hardware, and then in desktops, notebooks, etc. Um, overall, the ARM Linux space is looking extremely exciting, and the best is yet to come in the next few years. Yeah. yeah. All right. That was awesome. So, so Kurt. Thank you, Mike. Uh, you're, you're, you're within just a few gigaflops of being only six months behind number 500 on the top 500. That's right, yes. We're, we're in pretty rough shape right now. They, so we, and we have a couple of... No, I mean, your, your green thing... I thought that was a compliment. Oh, that was a compliment. Let, a let, 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 <laughs> less than a year behind real research machines. Well, and, and on the green 500, we look really good. On the green 500, yeah. you look amazing. But I'm saying that, uh, you know, 
52 gigaflops would have gotten you on the November list for the not green 500. Well, so I consider the source. So I mean, this is an exceptional. Company. Well, they so they have, <laughs> they have two lists on the green 500. They have yeah, I'm not I'm not looking at the green. I'm looking at top 500. Um, the old list. I'm looking at the old list. Um, something in the high 51 point something. So if, if you're super linear, is just a tiny bit super linear. So you you might have been on the list six months ago. The top 500. That's list, awesome. It's a phenomenon of, of the list. That it absolutely is. That, that moves that it moves faster than Moore's law. I think more people try to get on the top 500 list every year, so it actually moves faster yeah. than Moore's law. Yeah. So it's it's a moving target. I don't know if we'll catch it because it. Yeah. It, but it, it, but you you're you're only one trash can away. You're, you're only <laughs> yeah. You're you're, you're, you're only. Six months off of that, yeah. right. or six months plus epsilon. You, you'd have had a year ago. You'd have had a fairly decent number on. Well, we're going to look really good when the the stars align when the A15 comes out because Ubuntu 1210 will be shipping then, and uh, and that that product whoever has it first, which might be Samsung has the A15 product out first. So right now Qualcomm actually does. Okay, so that... Qualcomm's great series. That looks it's really cool. promising. There's a ST Ericsson Nova Store 9000 or whatever says they are going to get 210 gigaflops per ARM core, or per, per ARM chip. So that's two A15s. So that's that's a, another factor of 10 above what I'm getting. So, so whatever that product looks like, the, the great thing about the Panda board is it's somewhere in the middle of, of, of a product that someone who needs to do Android app development and someone who needs to do hardware driver development would buy. So it's got, it bristles with I.O. You got Wi-Fi, you got Bluetooth, you got two kinds of HDMI. It's, it's got tons of stuff on it, a little bit too much for us. We could knock a lot off for a board if we didn't have all that. Well, do, do you set the drivers to mask off the Bluetooth? Well, so I've tried two things. I've, I've RM modded them, and then I took it out of the kernel too, and I haven't seen any, any noticeable changes in, in power. So, so maybe that stuff gets warm anyhow, I don't know. Uh, but but the, the future is certainly within arm's length. They've, they've made the, no. the Gerber files available. I mean, if we knew what we were doing, we'd build our own. But you, 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 you basically have close to a world-class cluster there, even without talking to Yeah, them. so I'm thinking November might be, that. so then list comes out every six months, maybe the November try is going to be it. So, so th you, you, this is enough to actually do real science? Oh yeah. Easily. Especially with, you know, the kind of real science that happens in labs that, that don't need to get on the top 500. Single precision, you know, this, this thing plays right into our wheelhouse. Nice. So thanks, that's the great comments, yeah. and that, that's very helpful. So just a, a couple, if there are any other questions, but I did want to just kind of get Amir to, you know, to kind of, you know, stand up and pay some attention to, to him and the work. And he actually, you know, uh, mentioned a couple of corrections that, that uh, I, to clarify, you know, sort of how this came about and, and who the different players were in sort of a humble way. So Amir, maybe you could talk more about the, you know, kind of work that you have done on it and what other people have been involved with as well. It's actually the, the application has been written by some of the, the students, college students, undergrads in Boston University. And what we are doing is to have the copper cells like Neon and GPUs. Me and the friend you mentioned, Yash, his name is, and he, came, he went to India like two weeks ago. So. Uh, what we are doing is to have these copper processors actually um, uh, to have these, uh, make worth of these copper processors to have the number of gigaflops on these Panda boards. So that's that actual thing that you're doing, not the application that the application has been written before. And the application that you mentioned that's done by BU students, is that like the benchmarking application? The Linpack. The Linpack. OK, so, so the BU students, they basically constructed this Linpack. So they, they coded it, they compiled it, so that it would run on the, this cluster. Yeah. And and, um, and and so that got the initial first cut at this, and then for tuning it and you know tightening things up and getting more and also with the and, and, and work with the whole process and other stuff. So yeah. as you can see, it's really it's a it's a neat combination of hardware, software, systems engineering, and and uh, uh, 
trash can packaging. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't you can't do it with a lot of people involved. So thanks very much. That's an option. Yeah. So <clears throat> we have a few bits of hardware that arrived since the talk last month that we just had to show you since we didn't deliver on the Raspberry Pi last month. So the first one is a little bit um, different, and it's this thing called Little Bits. Um, actually, credit where credit is due. Last month we had a terrible AV setup, so Tony Metro has been researching the heck out of hardware that I could spend money on, and this is the result. So um, we're almost there. There is pretty good cameras. Uh, very nice, uh, fine control for the for the microscope. The only thing that still needs to be figured out completely is the um, is the lighting. Some things have built-in lighting that is not so good. Others don't, and it should be incandescent. But I'm pretty sure that we'll do better than last time. So this is the way the box looks like. For those of you that don't know little bits, it's uh, I have their startup. She's, uh, I believe, Lebanese American that was one of the founders of the Open Hardware uh, Summit in New York City. And she's a TED Fellow, I believe, the, in this year. She has been developing this educational system um, to teach electronics. And the idea is, you can watch her TED talk, but um, the idea is that you get this very nicely packaged thing to play with your kids, and that it's full of what is the equivalent of uh, Lego bricks for electronics that do a bunch of different things, from being power supply to uh, buttons, um, pressure sensors for how much you're pressing, and so on. And it becomes very easy to build a simple Simple circuit with these. Let's see what we can do. We can get the battery. There is a power supply module, and it's telling us that there is power. We can use the camera here. So we have module one with the battery. If it wants to stay put, there. Um, and let's see. I believe that there is a pulse in. Oh, there is a dimmer. These things are literally like Lego bricks. See, it, they are magnetic, and if you connect them the wrong way, they refuse to connect. Otherwise, they stick <coughs> together, like so. And um, there should be an LED somewhere. So, you can do the same thing. And by tuning the dimmer, I can. That's how it is, just the way <laughs> Right. And it pretty much. Um, is fairly self-assembling thing, and you can try things. So you can can't really break them, as far as I figured. Um, let's see if this is sufficient. You can measure how much pressure I'm putting on the pressure sensor with the scale of the thing. So wasn't there a Cambridge version of this, like uh, Resnick, or um, wasn't there like a Connectables or something? I think there were. Uh, it was at the Media Lab, like one kindergarten group. Yeah. And it was a combination between the um, fluid um, lab and the uh, like one kindergarten. It was. Uh, I think there were multiple attempts to do this. Um, this one probably came out at the right time, and it has the right amount of marketing with Aya being at the center of open hardware, then being a TED fellow, and she has her own TED talk, so that gives enough movement, enough uh, momentum to this thing that then it gets packaged by Wired. Mm -hmm. So you have a chance for these things to take off. And yet, from uh, their point of view, is that they want to build a library of components so that you can do things more complicated than what you can do here. And I thought it was a cool idea, so <clears throat> since I just got that, I thought it was worth the introduction. Then, there's another thing which I assembled while I was having a drink with Kurt and a few other fellows here. And since we were talking about panda boards, it's worth showing as well. There is a 
And actually, there are a number of uh, laser cut cases for Panda board out there. But this one is slightly in another league. Um, there is a good chance that for work reasons I might have to carry around an arm, so I decided to build it into something um, slightly more resilient. So this is a Panda board in completely metal case that comes from Austria and is basically as expensive as half a panda board. <laughs> uh, and it comes with its own antenna. So it's pretty solid and it should be capable of traveling even when the TSA throws your bags in, uh, in dark rooms. So <clears throat> fine Austrian engineering. I actually used to work for an Austrian, so when I bought this, I sent him an email saying, hey, I just bought my first piece of Austrian hardware since the PC XT power supply of a machine I had in the late 80s. So I'm not sure why it's made in Austria, but it's, it's done quite well, and, and it works. The problem is that it's priced high, it's priced in euros, and then you have to ship it from Austria all the way to here, so it winds up being 70, 80 bucks once you do all the all the jumping through hoops. Then we have the Raspberry Pi, and we didn't get it in time for last time, which obviously means that we actually got two this time around by the mysteries of how the world works. Now, um, I got one from each supplier, which is interesting because Turns out they're not packaged the same. Uh, this is packaged by Farnell in a very flimsy box. It then comes in a paper bag that is liable to get crushed. And in fact, this was crushed, but the board still works. This other one, slightly sturdier and more electronics-like, is the one packaged by RS, which is another, another British distributor. So I would say that RS wins in terms of packaging wars. Otherwise, the boards are pretty much identical. There is a slight difference in the size of one of the connectors, which is a problem for case manufacturers, but not for anybody else. Uh, since I did my uh, initial survey with, um, with the Farnell, I'll stick to that one. This one is the entire documentation that comes with it, which is for those of you that have been following the Raspberry Pi, the reason why it slipped one of the multiple months of slippage was getting the regulatory compliance done. <laughs> <coughs> they somehow thought that they could get away with um, not doing FCC and DC uh, emissions testing as a development board. But it turns out that when you're planning to make hundreds of thousands of them, and on top of that, when you ask and you're in Europe, then they tell you, well, of course, <laughs> You've got to do it. So this is the board in uh, a case that I got from uh, a British Linux user group that's now into Raspberry Pi case building. These are actually rather cheap. They're around $10. So I ordered a couple. Um, um, Limor Fried of Adafruit also has her own which I kind of like better because it has room to access the GPIO. And so um, Adafruit has been selling cables to access the GPIO ports on, on, the, on the RPI. This case doesn't allow for that. Um, so I'm, for now I'm packing one this way. And then when more cases become available from Adafruit, I'll pack the rest in the GPIO accessible way. So um, this is pretty much what we uh, what we went over last time. This is not Cortex-A9. Therefore, um, since Ubuntu is optimized for A9 for the thumb instruction set, we can't manage to run Ubuntu here. Not in the current builds, anyway. You could build 904. You could. Uh, run 904, but. So there are a bunch of distributions available. Debian, I believe, is the default, or Fedora is the default. Um, not entirely clear, but there are builds for Debian, Fedora, Arch Linux. They used, um, they used the Broadcom chip, 
PCM 2835 at 700 MHz. It's an older chip, but it's really cheap, and that's what allowed them to get to the um, uh, 25 to 35 price point that they have. The difference should be on whether you have the Ethernet connector on and whether you have 256 megs of RAM or 128. Now, the foundation announced changes, all of them will ship with 256 megs of RAM. So the difference that's left is whether you actually have the Ethernet connector on or not. I suppose if you're going to use a USB Ethernet, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> so we can do a little bit of a quick walkthrough. So let's see if this works well enough. Um, so have two USB and the Ethernet. This is the version B, the splurge $35 one. Um, all of them that were built in the first batch were version Bs, so don't take me as a, as a spender. I didn't have any option but ordering this one. Um, sound connector and RCA. The GPIO that I was mentioning is here in the corner. There are a couple of connectors, one for an LCD panel and one for uh, a digital camera, both of which are extensions that the foundation plans to make but hasn't released yet. I believe that they're working on the camera right now. There is a USB uh, mini connector Micro. here in the corner. Micro, thank you. Uh, to power the device. And then uh, there is a video. Is, and is that's DVID or uh, HDMI? Uh, I think it's HDMI. The, the, difference is the case you had said HDMI next to it. That's right. Mine's coming with HDMI. It is uh, HDMI. So, um, actually, that's an interesting consideration in, in light of what we were discussing before of the missing Apple connector. One thing that uh, you can notice when you look at how Apple changed their hardware is that they're having trouble with the size of the connectors that are on the size of the side of the device. That uh, they didn't introduce this connector because they're Evo, which they might be, but they introduced this connector because they couldn't fit the full VGA on the side of the laptop anymore when they moved to the uh, to the MacBook Air. And now that they shrank even the Pro, there is no room on the side of the laptop for an Ethernet connector because the laptop is thinner than Ethernet. So <laughs> the new Retina, it is. The new Retina Pro has HDMI though. Yeah, and that's what I was getting at. Because this connector is so thin, actually it works perfectly for them. So instead of having weird connectors, the new uh, Retina a MacBook Pro has. Having the body be HDMI. too thin for an Ethernet connector is a nice problem to have, I suppose. I suppose. <laughs> they give you extensions so that you have their Thunderbolt on one end and <laughs> Ethernet on the other. But so when, they, when, I, when I figured that that was the problem, it suddenly made sense because otherwise the mini display port was just a weird thing that I never quite got. So um, we can take a look just for um, a little bit more in detail. So um, there are effectively two big big chips. One is the the Broadcom EMC over there, which is uh, a system on chip. So everything is stuck in there except the video, which is in this other one. There isn't a whole lot more. Uh, there are the connectors that we're describing. This one is, if I remember correctly, the one for uh, the camera. And then there is over here the connector for, sorry, wrong way. Machine-wise, it's not bad. Um, 
there are LEDs, so you can debug what's going on with when uh, when it goes dead. Uh, there is a reset button, uh, and um, I would say that pretty much the only thing hobbling it is really the low amount of RAM. Other than that. Uh, I wouldn't have that many complaints. Uh, some people don't like the fact that um, the um, the video chip is proprietary. So you have to have binary blob as part of the drivers to deal with that. And uh, we know all the problems that go with that. So Have you test driven it up yet? Mm -hmm. Have you fired it up yet? I did fire it up uh, and you can actually uh, try to fire it up here. Try to create an image with Wheezy. If you take a look at uh, what's on my uh, what's on my Flickr page, you can see uh, the boot screen and how it comes up. I think that that would be quite adequate. The, the performance for the coding video is good because it's been optimized for that. I've read of people compiling XPMC for it basically as soon as it uh, is, as soon as it was released. Yeah. So you, you, you so what you can connect that to some outside storage uh, to the USB or something like that and you use it that way. Or? Yeah. You definitely can. You have two okay, USB so ports. Card too, so okay. So I would I would put the system on the SD card and the storage on USB, and off you go. Is there any further news on the Kirk board for a sort of electronics experimentation? Is that? I don't. I don't have any more. So this, there's a board that is uh, being developed by one of the developers of this board which is primarily designed for people who want to do, you know, it's kind of like a scale up from Arduino. Mm -hmm. So you can do one, and, it, and it basically there are a gazillion pins for I.O. on this chip that are essentially unused, but this board essentially makes them accessible for people who are programming. What's it called? I think it's Gert, Kurt, is this right? Gert, G-E-R-T. Yeah, yeah, that's, the, yeah, the, that's guy's, the designer's name. The guy's name is Gert. Yeah. And so it's got a whole bunch of, you know, I.O. things, LED and the big advantage to that is that you can access those pins through uh, Python instead of needing C++. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. There you go. That's not a penguin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like a raspberry. <laughs> it does. <laughs> and it does. Should be a penguin with a very bad rash. <laughs> 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 What if you, you've got a keyboard plugged into the USB port? That's right. And you've just got the screen display plugged into HDMI or VGA? Or? HDMI exclusive. Well, it might come over RCA too. Yep. 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 Four eighty. But it's just plugged right into an HDMI cable. Yeah. Oh, he doesn't know the password. No, he doesn't. It wasn't printed on the box. So now, but you've got no storage. So where is the operating system stored? Well, you got SD. Oh, so it's, it's an SD. Yeah. Yeah, but you don't have any. You don't have NAND or any of that stuff that card who and there's nothing. It's an SD card or nothing. Basically. Yeah. There's yeah. No. You want some water? It could be an SSD or a drive or something else, right? That it could boot off. Of. Just or does it only boot off the SD card? By default, it boots off the SD card. Yes, it is different. So you take the 
But the well, user is yeah, Pi. I almost positive you As long as there's an SD no, card in there to tell it to do that. Um, you, there's no man, no ROM at all. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Do I use name Pi with password Raspberry? Yeah, username Pi. Ah. It, it depends on the image. But password Raspberry. Oh, ah. Oh. Login time now. <laughs> Which distro is that? This is that, yeah.
to set R11. Um, R11 76 JZFS. So it doesn't have the word Cortex in it, if you don't want. Right, exactly. Sure. It's not an application processor, it's, uh, it's an embedded processor. It's more similar to the processor that we had when we were looking at the Western digital hard drive. Uh, architecturally, it's pretty much its cousin. This is the stuff they use for like blue red players. This is, yeah. it's what? 600. Because of the separate of the separate part to do the video decoding, you could play 1080. Uh, you could decode 1080 uh, video on this using the proprietary driver. But that's not because of the performance of the processor. That's because there is dedicated hardware to do this. So, all right. So uh, next piece of hardware. <coughs> Is this the one we have to turn the camera on for? Yeah, I guess we would. <laughs> so, this one... We're still looking at the pie. Uh, let me disassemble my... Yeah! What <laughs> happened? Don't disassemble number five. <laughs> <laughs> I actually did the that clean shut down. Thanks, Jabber. So I would say that my expectation of performance from this was none, and it's better than I expected. But it is no, uh, it is no panda board. So if number crunching is the idea or anything requiring CPU performance, I would rather go there. So. Uh, just for completeness, what's in the RS? Uh, nothing, a different print run of the regulatory compliance and one page of instructions as to what URLs to go to <coughs> uh, to get your, your system image. To keep things cheap, you don't get firmware image, which is fine because they keep updating them all the time anyway. Um, Kurt, how do I switch back to... Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mac. To, to VGA, yeah. You guys can do really well to manage to order two of those. <coughs> so let me see, where, where are we? This one needs to be. One from each, one from our ransom. Yes, but I mean, I never succeeded in getting three to either site to order even one. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. I tried to get them when you get me disappointed. Okay, so um, as I was saying, Adafruit is giving out the connectors, well it's not giving, it's selling the connectors to get the GPIO out. So the ideal scenario for me is to put the box, the other board in the Adafruit box, which is slightly more compact, have the GPIO connector, and then see what can be done with it in a better than Arduino format, or higher scale Arduino. There is a similar thing, uh, which eventually I'll have to present at Build's organization, I suppose, which is called uh, uh, Perl Bone, which is a Perl interface for Beagle Bone that's uh, in early development. For the Raspberry Pi, there is a GPIO library that's in Python. So there is an attempt to have the dynamic languages give you a decent interface to these hardware things. And uh, I'll, I'll try to play around with them before OSCON, So ask me in another month or two and, and I'll know more. So, the other one is the, the Q box, which um, I'm not sure why they sent me one, but they were very nice. Or rather, I asked through Marvell, and so when you ask through the Birger company, things work out. This one contains, um, this one contains a, a, a Marvell chip, instead of a Broadcom one, and it is basically a two-inch cube computer. And um, it's all black with a couple of holes. Uh, I have better pictures because it's hard to focus this in the appropriate resolution. It has four feet to cover the screws, but that's about it. In terms of ports, there is a power port. 
two USBs, one Ethernet, same video interface, and a slot for the um, for the SD card, which actually goes in the mini factor. On the front, there is you cannot see it because the plastic is not coming with the right reflectivity. There is a spot in the plastic which is IR transparent. So if you have a remote, it can read the remote. And there is optical audio and another uh, another uh, USB on the side. So this one is pretty cool. I can't open it here because it needs to work for OSCON and it's really fragile. But as it happens, I already prepared the pictures for OSCON. So, what does that board cost? The two inch one? Uh, it's in uh, it's in the hundreds. I can't remember the exact price. Let me see. You can pull it out from the website. One hundred and thirty-five. And I believe like the pie, it's also uh, unattainable at the moment. It's unattainable. That's why I had to get it through. Uh, I had to get it as a development sample through through the chip manufacturer. So I asked, I asked the chip maker, the chip maker said, we don't have any, however, we will give you a reference. This is made in Israel, actually. Uh, we'll give you a reference to the company that makes it. The company was like, oh, you're going to speak at Oscar, that's great, here's one. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. so uh, marketing work. actually works sometimes. Um, <clears throat> here is, um, they were actually really kind because they sent it right away. I, I had two pieces of hardware that I wanted to add to the talk, one being the, um, what's the, the other ridiculous name? Cotton okay. candy. The, I wanted to add the cotton candy and uh, the Q box. <laughs> and the cotton candy is unfindable. <laughs> so I think I won't manage to add that to the talk, but uh, the Israeli team was really nice to say. They uh, sent me a test device immediately, and so I actually managed to take a look at it already. Which uh, so we've had the principal, the principal CTO of Qbox is Rabbi Akuri, and we've had him up at BLE before. He's the guy oh, from, at Marvel. Yeah, yeah. So he's the guy at Marvel who did the what's the box? Uh, I, I guess he was instrumental with the Google Play. Right. So he did a lot of software. So this is to prove the size. <laughs> it is actually a two cubic inch cube. I think that um, you actually start running into the problem that the cables are more massive than the device. So if you plug a few cables into this thing, keeping the device standing without tape is kind of hard, especially if you're going to put it under the TV or something. So that's the that's kind of small scale that we're reaching. The other thing is <coughs> Velcro. The outside is plastic. Uh, Velcro would work very well too. Uh, the outside is plastic, but it has an inside uh, metal cage, which makes it uh, considerably more robust. Uh, you can see there on the right the, the IR window for the for the IR the open diode that's inside. An angle view, this is the rear view that I was showing you before. This is uh, this is the um, the system card. It comes already preloaded. I don't know if it comes preloaded with Android or with Ubuntu. They have only and they have a lot of images built for it, but only two are official. One is Android. The other one is uh, is 1004 Maverick. Uh, this is again the size. We've seen this, so how does it look from the inside? Let me see where does the deconstruction start here. I think, uh, I think we'll start here. So you can see the aluminum cage that, that's wrapped around it. There, is a few, uh, there are a few bits of insulation to, uh, to prevent shorts in some spots, but otherwise it's fairly simple. Um, Opening, opening it is not too much of a problem, however, um, the risk is not so much in damaging the board, the risk is in damaging the case, because the clay case is a small bit of plastic and you're going to put the stress on the screws. And 
it's, uh, I wouldn't recommend opening it and closing it all the time. Here you can see the RAM, two Hynix chips, they're fairly easily spotted. Here you can see uh, the IR sensor. The uh, optical audio output is over here. And uh, there are the connectors in the rear for Ethernet and USB. This one comes with one gigabyte of RAM, so it's considerably more beefy mm. than, the, than the Panda and then the Raspberry Pi in that regard. It should have decent graphic performance as well. They tout support for OpenGL. They also believe that they can do HDMI at 1080p, which is something that the board makers can easily guarantee because it's really something that the chip maker gave them. So there is no doubt, there is no problem trusting that. The RAM, since in the past we have, uh, we have run into issues with the speed of RAM, especially things like the Shiva plug, uh, the RAM is at 800 megahertz, so it's not it's not completely hobbled slow RAM like in other scenarios. Uh, there is no JTAG, which usually which usually pisses me off, but uh, that's how it is. There is no JTAG, however, they claim it's unbreakable. I'm not sure exactly what it means. Um, I think it means that you cannot overwrite some part of the firmware. But um, I don't know. In any case, they claim it's unbreakable. Right? That's like a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> uh, professionally, I'm a product manager, and there is a product manager joke that says um, engineers usually say that the requirements have to be written perfectly so that no one can be misunderstood. And so the product manager joke goes, okay, throw down. There is no requirement you can write that I cannot uh, misinterpret. <laughs> <laughs> and it's pretty much the same thing. Unbreakable? Mm. But I, I, I appreciate the spirit. So standard infrared receiver for 38 kilohertz. I'm not sure, I'm not up to date on who uses what frequencies. So. I'll take that at face level. The, the chip is an Armada 510, so it's an metal chip, as you were saying. Let's look at the rest of these pictures. This is the front side, so pretty much everything we've seen already, power connector and uh, the system. What's on the bottom right? Uh, what's on the bottom right? Mm, it looks like a USB 3 to me. It's like yes, uh, it, 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 it. Yeah, it looks like yeah. The, the, the specs say it has an ESATA port. Oh, ESATA, yeah, ESATA three gigabit, uh, three gigabit, uh, and there is no more. Yeah, so it's easy. All right, that's actually good for the media center discussion we were having before, and it's similar to what uh, to what the latest uh, plugs have. It's in line with that, and it makes sense because it's a very similar chipset. Bottom view, so you, we have the Armada 510 there, two of the Hynix chips, I guess there are two more on the other side, system. I don't think there is anything extra interesting to see here. Oh, we've seen this already. I couldn't get the chip in focus, so there are a lot of pictures of that. So the Armada 210? 510. 510. Wi-Fi? No Wi-Fi? Uh, as far as I know, no Wi-Fi. I'm wondering what's... Can we replace the battery? <laughs> Just battery for real-time clock? That's what it looks like. That's what it looks like, yeah. Yeah, that's where it is. Cool. It actually has a real-time clock, wow. unlike some other ARM boards that we know about. What's 
a thing that looks like a switch on the, on, on the left. Right That's the power. power. This one here. Right oh, below power that looks like what? Four dips? These ones? I think that they are LEDs. No, above it. Above it. Oh, no, I don't know what above that is. Above it's the coax power. Sure. This is the power connector? Yeah, it looks like. This yeah. is the power connector. About the power connector? I'm not sure what it what. No, that's the. Oh, wait, what do you mean? The lights. That's the. Um, that's, that's the optical oh, the full audio. connector up there. Okay. Yeah, that's the optical, optical audio. I thought you were asking me what's in between the two. And I can see some circuitry, but I don't know. Okay, this is the first light on the panel board. This is it coming up on my TV. Um, you can see there are a few LEDs and some of them you can trigger and others just tell you that the board is alive, which is a nice touch. So, I think that's it. We could, if you want to try, we could try booting it, but um, have you snap a relatively soon. Everybody's tired. But how long does it take to boot? Well, we can just plug it in and see what happens. How does this compare power-wise to the data board that's in the cluster? Same? Should be similar, but I haven't put it in my arm on it for a lot yet. So I don't have any measurement. We'll look it up at least. But processing power comparable? So well, so the Amada 510 is not a Cortex, right? No. You know what you're no. So it's going to be more like a Raspberry Pi than the data board. Right. The, the cotton candy does have a, a Cortex A9, so if you have gotten that, that might have been more comparable. That would have been interesting. Panel, but you can't get one. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Though I think and the cotton candy you could use a bit more power. Just because the. Uh, doesn't have integrated Bluetooth as well? I don't know. Sure. But you can compare apples to apples where between Marvel because. They have that architectural license that's yeah. their own implementation. Okay. They don't they don't use the standard ARM like IP license. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what their implementation looks like. I mean th this this whole thing derives from the old deck strong arm strong arm license. Oh, really? So the digital had strong arm that got sold to Intel, which then sold it to Marvell. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the lineage. And DEC had its own ARM architectural license and their own implementation. So it doesn't quite compare, it's not an apples to apples comparison against the core So it's ARM V7. It is. So Marvell is very proud of their architectural license and they say, well, this allows us to do whatever we want. However, the problem is that the divergence with others is also a little bit of an annoyance. And that's what happens when you look at the, at the plugs and you cannot run the latest Ubuntu on the plugs because they are pushing forward the, the previous architecture and the, and the Ubuntu is compiled for the latest processors, so Ubuntu expects a quartet. Well, Ubuntu expects the thumb instruction optimization, which other chips would have, but the ones that Marvell is making doesn't, don't have. Um, let me see. Uh, Okay, one last thing, which probably should have opened with, but so we're talking about cases for different things, but the most interesting one is this case for the panda board, which is <laughs> a printed case, not in the um, old style, I mean the new style sense of 3D printing, but in the old style sense of paper printing. <laughs> you literally print your case on a sheet of paper and then you fold it. And I suppose it works for a $35 board. Uh, the only thing that I can say about this is that it's incredibly annoying because they're making it on A4 paper. So... Oh, 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 oh.
In, in Canonical, we have printers that print anything because we get documents from Europe, so we have A4. But if you do not have A4, there is some resizing in your future. Um, other than that, JPEG is, is kind of neat. You can print it on some cardboard or photocopy on some cardboard. Let me see. Uh, Kurt, you have to show me how to look over it again. To HDMI? Yeah, one See what happens when you plug this thing in. Good to know. <coughs> now it's going to turn out that it boots right hat and I get fired. <laughs> yeah, it's being recorded. <laughs> So I have no idea. There is an LED in the front window showing that it's alive. So something is happening. But we get no video signal detected. There is an LED on the front here, but it's it's not uh, blinking, so we don't get any indication of what's going on. You know, we could probably yeah. pull down the settings tab on the green yeah. screen application, tell it we want blue this oh, yeah. time, and yeah. put any background we want behind Federico. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it would be hilarious. You can, you can do chroma key with either, with either blue or green. All right, well, there was a big win. You just can't have the person. We'll, we'll, we'll figure out what's going on for next time. Oh, yeah. It was too hot. <laughs> Did you halt it the correct way? <laughs> <laughs> well, I cannot halt it if I cannot get to a terminal. <laughs> That's the correct way with the small the machines that yeah. take their power away. You can assume you're in a terminal and just start typing. <laughs> so Even our success, no, biggest success with the password. <laughs> no, we, he, he, we know he can't, uh, he doesn't know the root password. So. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, for this one, I literally don't know the root password because I never booted it. So, but if it booted, it was very trivial to look it up. It's just. I think I will not do in image and new card. And I on this one. All righty, so that's it.